Chris Gayo is going to uh, moderate this. Let's have some fun. So, Mike, product of Andover, Massachusetts, obviously four-year starter at Vanderbilt. What, what attracted you to, to the Vanderbilt program and, and, and really uh, Coach Corbin? So I, I knew from day one that I stepped on campus that I was going to be at Vanderbilt. Um, the way they run their program, their communication, their accountability, everything that they do is top-notch. <clears throat> and it was something that I wanted to be a part of. And so I decided from that moment, even though if they didn't know it, that I was going to be a part of that program. And it was a chance to get away from Boston, from mm. Andover, to kind of have something for myself and have my own career and pave my own path a little bit. Love it. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that that culture. You arrive on campus, you're a freshman, you know, talk a little bit about what Corbin was able to instill in, in terms of just teamwork and camaraderie and, and really kind of coaching you up to be a leader, but also a man. Yeah, that, that's what he does best is, you know, you may be a good baseball player turning into a great baseball player under his wings, but you're also going to learn to be accountable, be a good person, play for the guy next to you, in front of you, behind you, and you're never going to be giving up an inch with him. And he made you feel that it didn't matter if you were folding clothes, if you were hitting homers, if you were erasing chalkboards, whatever it was, that job was always important. And so he let you know that every step of the way, everyone mattered, and you invested in that, and you mm -hmm. believed in it, and that created the environment of success. So you get drafted out of high school, decide to go to Vanderbilt. You have the opportunity at the end of your junior year, you get drafted by the Mariners, and they offer a $300,000 signing bonus. Obviously, for a kid that came up your path, that's a really tough ticket to turn down. What, mm -hmm. was, what was that process like? What, what was that um, moment like in your life to have to really make a decision on, do I take it now or do <laughs> I stick it out? So that one was tough. Um, the way it's supposed to work is it's a long process where you negotiate, you go back and forth for weeks on end, and they say, you know, start off at 200, mm. come back at 250, and it all got minimized to the last, like, two hours. And so they said, you know, we'll give, we'll give you 200 grand. I said, you know, it's not, it's not enough to take me away from, from my last year of school. So they come back 250 and I'm starting to call my agent, my grandfather, try and figure this whole thing out and say, you know, what's the right thing for me? Meanwhile, my mom and, and my wife are downstairs crying. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. So I'm like, there's a lot. I'm like freaking sure. out. I'm like, all right, what do I do? Do I do this? And so finally I tell them I'm not going to do it. They call back and say, we'll give you 300 grand. So I'm like, that's, that's a lot of money. That's yeah. life changing money. Yeah. And so I called my grandfather and said, you know, here's, here's the situation. He said, well, at that point, like, I'm comfortable with you doing whatever is best for you. Like, you make your decision. Just let me know when you're done. I was like, okay. So I called my agent and I said, all right, let's do it. And he goes, are you sure? I said, uh, no, <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And he goes, okay, so you don't want to do it. I was like, uh, no, I, I can't do it. And he's like, all right, I'll let him know. And just calls back and. <laughs> That's how that ended, and then ended up with the Orioles. So you get drafted in the 14th round by the Orioles, 2013. And follow-up question to that is, what was, your, what was your signing bonus after your senior year with no leverage? <laughs> 25 grand and a, a one-way plane ticket. <laughs> so a couple packs of gum and a used washing machine, but you had to pick it up. Exactly. You get drafted in 2013, 14th round by the Orioles. You show up you know, have a short season. Let's talk about your first full season in the minor leagues. Obviously, it's a very different environment from that Vanderbilt team where everyone's pulling on the same rope. Everybody has your back. The guy next to you will take a bullet in his shoulder for you. Now, all of a sudden, you're in a bullpen. You're in a locker room where it's a job and it's cutthroat. And these guys, you're competition and you're taking food off their plate. Talk about that, that juxtaposition. It changed completely. Uh, like you said, everybody's trying to move in one direction and trying to better the program that's been there before them. So you step in there day one and you want to make it better. Now, it's not necessarily the case when you get to pro ball because sure. everybody is out for themselves. They want to be the most successful. They want to make the most money. 
they want to beat you, even though they're on the same team. So they don't care if you're 0 for 3. They want you to be 0 for 3. You know, they, they want you to be making errors. They want you to be hung over and not being able to perform. So they'll influence you in any way that they can. And that's what's hard to understand until you get to that big league level is that throughout the minor leagues, everyone has the same goal and it's hard to root for the guy next to you. So now, taking what I learned from Vandy and understanding that there's a bigger picture, that's probably what gave me more success in the grand scheme of things and understanding that I do want the guy next mm. to me to do well because this is a team sport and you can't learn that in the big leagues. You have to already have that ingrained in you or you're never gonna be successful. Right. And so it was, was really nice to have that leading up to the minor leagues but it was also a complete shock to see the guy waiting for you to get hurt or hoping that you go over or get ejected or do something stupid. Right. So it's, it's a different, uh, different environment for sure. So over the course of six seasons in the Orioles system, you played 710 games, 2,600 at-bats. You're playing 140 games in 148 days each season. You're going from Greensboro to Hagerstown, Buffalo to Toledo. You're riding on a Greyhound bus to stay in a Best Western with a roommate. You know, during the course of, of, of that time period, what were some points of pain and, and what were some points of growth in that phase of your life? Uh, yeah, some of the pain is physical from being cooped up on a bus for right. 10 hours and sleeping in odd positions. And then there's the times where you show up to Hagerstown and you go and your bed's a mess, you have bed bugs and you just feel like you're legitimately in a horror film and you just can't find a way to sleep, but you know you need to. Your roommate doesn't speak the same language as you. You're trying to figure out, how am I gonna get through this? Mm. And those are the moments where you have to dig down and figure it out for yourself and you have to lean on your past and your experiences and say, you know, I have a goal. In order to get there, I have to go through this. So you find a way to put up with it and then you just have to kind of grind it out from there and make sure that you're putting one foot in front of the other so you can eventually run and then jump. <laughs> so you, you finally get the, the call up and, you know, unbelievable, you know, overnight, you're, you're up the entire night trying to get from Sacramento to San Francisco, trying to get some sleep in between that six hour window to be dressed and at bat um, in the matter of hours, um, you know, you go 0 for 3 in your first game, but that, that slump doesn't last too long. Um, so let's cue the video. Every, every pilot has their, their first landing. The video is a little bit of a microcosm for the first 25 games of, of your major league career, right? You're doing some really good stuff, but the team's struggling overall, right? It's a roller coaster of, of emotions. What's that first month even like for you? Well, you know, just like the video, it's a roller coaster. You know, it's, it's okay, this is great. I just got a hit, you know, even though I thought I popped out to left. And then all of a sudden, okay, oh, God, this is not good. I'm about to be thrown out. Now I have to walk back and kind of hang my head saying, like, all right, well, I should be happy I just got a hit, but I just got picked off, and now I got to face my manager. This is not going to be good. Right. And as a, as a good manager should, he just tapped me on the butt and said, hey, you're good. Don't worry about it. Keep hustling. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of those things where I, I learned that making the mistake is okay with good intent. You know, it, I'm trying to help the team, trying to hustle, trying to do what's right, and just kind of caught an unlucky break. And that's how it went for a little while. So I had to understand that failure was part of it, to be okay with the failure as long as I'm working as hard as I can and trying to help the team win and doing it the right way, then things will eventually start falling my way. Let's talk about failure for a second because I, I believe whether you're in Major League Baseball or you're in a sales organization, you're going to run into a fear of failure. And how were you able to get past that? How were you able to slay the failure dragon and, and, and really understand that, you know, you either win or you learn. It's, mm. it's not a win or lose situation. Yeah, that, that's a really great way to put it is it was win or learn. Um, and I was kind of bound up and tired and not being myself and trying to figure out the ropes because I'm in a clubhouse with guys who have won World Series that are making a killing that 
have achieved everything that anybody who plays the game wants to do, and so you're kind of a little intimidated. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't able to be myself. I was a little afraid of the feeling that I would have if, when it's over, saying, you know, oh, I got, I got to play in the big leagues for a day. You know, like, that was always my goal, and when that happened, I was satisfied with it, but then three days go by, five days go by, ten yeah. days go by, and the expectations, goals, and dreams start to shift, right? So you want to be in the big leagues for as long as possible. So I was scared to have that conversation for someone to say, hey, it's over. So <clears throat> when I got called into the, the manager's office in Milwaukee and got optioned, uh, then I didn't get optioned. And then I'm in this limbo, and I look All back and I said- All in a 20-minute period. <laughs> right, you know, it's like, go take a shower. Oh, okay, I'm getting optioned, oh God. Hey, I'm back in the lineup. Like head spinning, not knowing where I am. Right. And then all of a sudden I realized that that's what I was scared of. And it didn't hurt, right. didn't sting. It was a, a sense of release. It was reality hitting you in the face and then you being able to take the blow and say, oh, I can roll with that, no that's big right. deal. And right. then we just kind of went forward from there and then started to play at my ability because I didn't have that hold me back. Yeah, and play at your ability, you did. Four-game series with the Rockies was next on the schedule, and, you know, you bat 450, couple home runs. Now we're cooking. Here's the payoff to Yastrzemski. Then, that one is well back there. He hit it there. And the Giants take the lead. So two home runs here in the third is Yastrzemski knocks out his 14th of the year. And the Giants lead two to one. Now it's four to two Giants. That one is hit well. Deep left center field. Way back there. Goodbye. That is a spectacular home run. Jastrzemski has done it again. It's his second of the night. And the Giants now lead six to two. Deep. Way back there. It's on to the balcony. Number three for Yastrzemski. Wow. That was a spectacular home run. It's 25 feet above the ground to that balcony. His third home run of the night, and the Giants take the lead. He hit it out over the pool, and the Giants taking the lead. It's 10 to 9. I don't believe it. That was over the 413 foot marker. That's a graveyard. He was just sitting on fastballs and licked his chops when that ball came in about belt high. It's 100 and, 106 miles an hour. So your first major league home run comes against the team that drafted you. Obviously, you're not a vindictive person, but <laughs> for the rest of us, walk us through how special that was and what it really, you know, kind of exemplified in your eyes. It was just one of those gratifying moments where everything started to unfold. Um, you know, hitting a homer in a big league game is really cool. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the pinnacle of your, what you can do as a hitter. You know, you can't have a better hit than a home run. Um, and to be able to do that against a team that, you know, in my head and yeah. in my eyes had essentially told me, like, you're not good enough to play for this team. And then to be able to go up and hit a home run against them and jog around the bases at their park was was awesome. Mm -hmm. and, I, and at that point, I had kind of given away that vindictive feeling of saying, like, I had a grudge and I always wanted to go beat them if I ever got the chance to play them. But then in that situation, I looked back and I said, like, I was kind of appreciative of mm. them because they didn't have to trade me. I could have been stuck there for another year and may have never gotten that opportunity if they didn't let me go and so that was when things changed and I realized that you know it was a blessing for them to let me go instead of looking at it the other way. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us a little bit about that series because I obviously you know I was in attendance and I thought it was a really cool collection of really your road to that moment, right? I mean, there were so many people being an East Coast game, you growing up on the East Coast that were there. Talk a little bit about just that collection of, uh, of individuals that were able to show up for you and what it meant to you. Yeah, so the best part about it was having so many friends and family there. We had probably 40 people um, 
and it was a, a wild time to be able to play in front of aunts, uncles, cousins, my grandmother, um, just friends. So it was just a special moment to have to have everyone there and to be able to accomplish my first, you know, big feat there. And, you know, it was funny talking to one of my buddies on the other team, catcher Austin Wins, giving me some grief saying, uh, you know, here's, here's how we want to pitch you, you know. I told them this is what you like, this is what you don't like. <laughs> um, so the networking aspect in, in baseball is, is pretty nice too. Yeah. Um, but then I had another buddy, uh, Johnsy, who had one of those feelings, you know, relates back to and John the Z Vandy. played with you at Vandy, right? Yep, three years at Vandy. And, you know, it was one of those moments where he had a feeling and was talking to you guys and said, like, I, I got to go. He's going to hit a homer. And everyone's like, what? And he's just like gone. And he still got the video. He was out in right field. And, you know, there was a section. There's a big wall in Camden. And he went around the wall into the other section. And he just had a feeling that's where it was going to be. And sure enough, the ball lands like five rows right in front of him. And John Z goes down and gets the ball. So it's uh, one of those things where your boys are going to have your back. And, mm -hmm. that, and that's what John Z did. And that's what I learned at Vandy. And it was ultimately a full circle of where starting from that Vandy moment, getting to the big leagues, ending up at that Vandy moment with, with John Z out in the outfield for that. That's cool. Your whole career, you've been a four-tool player, right? And for those who don't know, the five tools of baseball, you've got speed, you've got hitting for average, you've got fielding and arm strength. And all of a sudden, you know, you've broken a Giants rookie record that dates back to 1972, hitting 21 homers on a short season. You're a power hitter now, right? What's, what's changed? Is it, is it something that you just all of a sudden – figure it out or is it something that you really you know all of the kind of previous work that you put into this has now materialized and is humming uh a lot of the previous work came into it because you have that that hard frame where you have those skills that you need to be good in general so mm -hmm. your hitting technique your basic strength all these things that essentially have a limit that you try to get to but the thing that I think helped the most was never being accepting of where I was right. and with my swing and saying that like there's always something new to learn and there's always something else to understand and not being satisfied with mm -hmm. good. Like I, I wanted my swing to be great and whatever that entailed, there wasn't a hard definition of great. It was, I just want it to be better than it was yesterday. So I think by being open and being willing to learn more, even on the things that you know maybe weren't comfortable for me at first, mm -hmm. where I didn't know if I believed in it until I tried it. And then when I continued to try going down the trial and error road, and I eventually molded into where I was this year, and it, it was just a result of the hard work and the willingness to try something new. Now you're, you're a power hitter. Tell us, you know, kind of where that power comes from. Is it raw strength? Is it patience at the plate? Or is it reading pitchers? Where, where, did, where did you feel like you got the most lift in those hard skills versus soft skills? Um, you know, a lot of it came from, from that patience of waiting till I was strong enough and working hard enough to be strong enough. But a lot of it came from advice from my grandfather and letting me know that my power was going to be the last thing to come mm -hmm. and understanding that, you know, his, his real power didn't come till he was 28. Um, he told me that, and I never believed him until <laughs> I got to when I was 28. And he just told me to, to be patient. And his, his theory on hitting was always wait, 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 and attack. So I, I'd been, been patient and been waiting. And then when I finally felt like I had the tools, the skill set, the ability, then it was on. Attack. Yeah, exactly. So I guess at this point we should bring up your grandfather. Um, you know, he is uh, Carl Yastrzemski, Triple Crown winner, seven gold gloves across a 23-year career, all with the Red Sox Hall of Famer. Um, everyone had a certain date circled on their calendar when you got called up. Uh, and with our good friend Paul, uh, Paul Frankenberg speaking it into existence, um, you got to play in Fenway. It's hard to put into words. 
you know, it was one of those moments that you hold on to forever and I'll never forget to know the greatness that my grandfather had in Boston and for them to appreciate that, accept it, and let me have a little piece of that with him was a great act on both organizations. To see the first picture is just so beautiful and so much love for all of our family. Be able to catch your first pitch at a visiting ballpark, you know, it's not a normal thing. And for them to make that happen was, was really, really cool. I think my dad put it best before the weekend started. He said, you've loved this man for, for 10 years. You've been a, one of his biggest fans, but his family has been dreaming of this day forever. And really what was special was watching his mom and his grandmother and his family, the Wessons and the Yastrzemskis. The minor leagues are tough, and I think it's part of baseball that um, the fans don't always get to see. It's really the families and the teammates, and it's that community from the team to our families that really keep you going. When you have someone like her in your corner day in and day out, that I, it's the easiest job in the world for me. It's been a wild ride so far, and hopefully it just keeps going in the same direction. Everyone was warm and welcoming. It felt like I was playing a home game. It was surreal. Everything went quiet. High in the center field, it is out of here! Unbelievable! I just absolutely freaked out. You just have those flashbacks of all of the struggles throughout the years and calls of, hey, I got moved down, or hey, this is happening, or it all flashes through your mind at once. All the emotions he must be feeling right now. We put everything into it. Our families put everything into it, and it's just pride, I think, is the best word, and then just pure joy. It was really unique and special to be able to have those moments. I don't have the right words to thank everybody enough. So one thing I love about that video is um, it really highlights, you know, it, it gives a little bit of a, a vantage point behind the person, behind the player that everybody sees on TV. And I think it, it brings to light the support system. Uh, and, and you take a lot of pride in, in having built that fairly intentionally and keeping those, uh, you know, who are good influences around you very close. Talk, talk a little bit about that and, and why that is so key to your success. Yeah, uh, I would never have been anywhere near where I am without the support system. Kind of just to start the whole thing off, my wife Paige is the rock of, of it all. Um, she's always there for support for the good, the bad. You know, we met freshman year in college, mm -hmm. and from that day on, she was the number one fan. And to have someone stand by your side for that long through all the terrible times, mm -hmm. through the good times, from spring training when she was teaching and she couldn't be there, we spend two months apart and she would call every day and never miss a beat. Mm -hmm. And to have someone who would be behind you 100% like that is the most important thing in life and I could never ask for anything more than that and I got so lucky with her keeping me in the game where she said I would tell her multiple times where like I'm done yeah. I'm over this like I can't do it anymore and her talking me back into it and saying like you've been working your whole life like I believe in you and I know you can do this to be able to go and prove the support system right mm -hmm. is the best feeling in the world. And then to go from there, having my mom, my grandmother, cousins, you, Chels, your parents, it's just to build a foundation like that is more important than probably what's going on on the field because we're at the field for 10 hours a day, but then we gotta go home and you can't 
do home alone. Right. You know, you got you have another team that you got to play for. And talk a little bit about you know what's what's at home is at home and, and creating that that division because it is important and I think it's part of the process of, of becoming a pro. Yeah, and and part of that, like you're saying, is coming from my grandfather's advice and teaching me how to understand that I have to leave the game at the field and I have to leave my life at home at home. So when I show up to the field, you know, I always have my phone in case there's an emergency, but it's usually on silent. And because I have to do what I got to do at the field to be ready for the game, have to perform and help that team. Same thing when I go home, I make sure that all my preparation that I do at the field, if I have to stay late, I do it there. I don't come home and watch videos and film mm -hmm. of myself and take away from family. Mm -hmm. um, because just as much as I've believed in me, the support system has believed double. Mm -hmm. And at one point when things are tough and you're in the worst of the worst and the peanut butter jelly sandwiches just aren't tasting good <laughs> anymore, the ramen is too salty that yep. day, the eggs aren't boiled right, right. Um, you have to lean on somebody. And those are the times where I would say, like, I'm over this. Like, I don't want to play anymore. I don't want to go through this. I hate it. That's when Paige would say, you're wrong. Like, you have to believe in yourself because we've believed in you this whole time, and we know you can do this. And that brings a completely new side of confidence to say, like, I can do this for my family, mm -hmm. for my support system. Like, prove them right and let them know that they're unwilling Unwillingness to ever give up yeah. on you and unconditional love was the right thing for them to do. Beautiful. Well, I think it's kind of cool. This has naturally come to a nice full circle conclusion when you think through, you know, Vanderbilt where you did build such great friendships and, you know, so aligned with your team and playing for each other. You lose that in the early stages of your professional path. And then for it to come back full circle where, you're playing for your team again, and, and, and that team is on the field, but that team's also behind you, and they're, they're not on, on the, the highlight reel. Exactly. So anyway, I think this has been uh, a lot of fun, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, bud.